Scoot, episode six, if you can believe it. We're on the sixth episode of Scoot Talk Sports. So a big thank you right off the top to everybody who's here in chat on twitch.tv slash SC. O-O-T-R. I appreciate you guys being here so very much. If you guys want to take part in the show recording where you have an opportunity to ask questions, maybe partake a little bit, be sure to tune in on Twitch at 12 o'clock Central Standard Time on Monday and Fridays. I'm trying to do it uh, twice a week, and then it uh, drops on the podcast about a day later. So big thank you to everybody who's jumped in. I think we have a great show ahead of us. We have the enigma, the mystery the Canadian soccer super fan, CPL Wooden Spoon, joining us today. We'll be talking a little bit about the Canadian women's team win this morning, which will be un- unbelievable vibes to to talk about for sure. Uh, if you missed it, the Canadian women won the gold in the women's soccer event at Tokyo Olympics, which was an incredible feeling this morning. Uh, we'll also be talking a bit about how he got into this uh, character, this account, uh, how he got involved in um, getting getting becoming such a super fan of Canadian soccer, basically. And then our second guest is going to be Jose Galan from Valor FC. He's a footballer who started in uh, Atletico Madrid's academy setup and has gone throughout the world in his career. A a pretty amazing adventure, if you ask me, uh, and has landed here in Winnipeg with Valor the last couple of years. So it's an opportunity to pick his brain and, and see you know, what, what he thinks about the city, what he thinks about his career, and what are some of the favorite memories that he's had throughout that adventure. So without any further ado, we're going to go ahead and move into our first guest. As So for those who don't know Wooden Spoon, Wooden Spoon is a Twitter account that started when the Canadian Premier League started. Can you give us a little bit about how that account started and what the intention was when you first started it? Well, originally it was a group of supporters who uh, were trying to take away the power from the uh, the International Supporters Council, uh, the ISC, who runs the, like, the shield for MLS, and they do the spoon, just because we don't really like them as an organization. And then uh, uh, through that, it evolved just to sort of bridge the gap between what I thought people might have been missing from the Canadian lock- soccer landscape. Mm-hmm. It, it, it seemed like there was a, a little bit of a lack of knowledge when it came to some of the lower leagues that were feeding into the professional leagues. And it would be nice to showcase like how how people got to where they were. And I think that's something that you know me and you have chatted a bit about, but before is is just the breadth of the culture of, of soccer, of football in Canada is always a lot bigger than I think people you know give it credit for. Um, there's so many people, so many clubs throughout this nation. You mentioned you kind of had an issue with that supporters group that handles you know the shield for the MLS and those sorts of things. Um, what is kind of your like? Do you want to talk a little bit about what the issues you saw there were? Yeah, I just think it's a bunch of like guys who uh, are exclusionary. I feel like it's like we have a cool club and you can't be part of it. And I didn't want that at all for our league. Like this was a chance to have an inclusive league for everybody. That uh, I don't know. Like they they took everything so seriously. I got messages from them trying to like figure out who I was because they wanted to to run the show for that. And I just thought it was super weird that. The fans weren't the fans. It was it was like it was like ultra groups kind of thing, like just exclusionary stuff. You know, yeah, I think, and that's kind of the opposite of what I've. You know, I think we want to see in the Canadian soccer landscape. Right? Exactly, we want to see inclusionary. Bring your friends, bring your family, bring someone new. Like we want to bring everybody into that kind of that big red tent. I guess I'll say if I steal a, a term from somewhere else. That's exactly um, it. It's really it's it's really interesting though the the idea of putting together a, a, a sp- you know sending over a spoon to a team saying hey congrats or sorry in a sense uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you finished last in the league where did that that kind of uh, idea start from that's a tradition from other places isn't it yeah yeah it comes out of England uh, it, it comes from sort of the old Arthurian colleges in England uh, you'd get the award if you finish last in a lot of different sports and then it carried over to MLS and over here. I think maybe Australia has it. Uh, but for me, it was also like, I, I don't know, Canadians were good at taking the piss out of each other. And like I didn't, I didn't think anyone would be offended. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like we handle things better than other people. Yeah, the banter is definitely, I, I think the banter is always done with a little bit of love, right? You know what That's I mean? That's what like, it is. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, I, I never want anyone to feel bad. I just, I just think it's like, you know. So and here's like, a, here's a yeah, question. Sorry. No, I, it's all good. I just wanted to know if you've ever acted. Did you actually send the spoon over to FC Edmonton that first year? Uh, well, Halifax won it the first year. Or and, Halifax, uh, yeah. yeah it, it, the, the one has been sent to 
to somebody within the organization each year. I make one every year for for the team. Uh, FC Edmonton were lucky because they also got iron on badges. Love it. Love it. Iron on badges for the spoon. And I mean, I, I don't know if I saw them wear it, but we'd love we'd love it if we saw it, right? I heard one fan I sent them, I gave like I, I pressed a whole bunch of them and I gave them away for, for fans because I didn't want to charge anybody any money because I'm obviously taking the piss. And I heard one fan put it on their kit, so I'm pretty happy. I mean, that would be kind of funny. Hey, it's like, hey, I'm taking the piss on your team. Could you also pay me money <laughs> to wear this on your kit? Man? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so we're avoiding a little bit of the, the elephant in the room here. We we had an amazing moment this morning as Canadian soccer fans. And I'd what like to chat day. with that. Love the chat with that with you for a bit. Um, Canada winning the gold medal at the Tokyo Olympics in a in a, in a shootout, a penalty uh, uh, shootout with the Swedish team, a team that is incredibly strong and, and honestly was favored for this game. What was your feeling coming out of that match? Like, wh- how, how did you react? Oh, I was having a heart attack. I went and bought a bunch of beer. <laughs> <laughs> it was great, man. Uh, I don't know. I, 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 if I'm going to be honest, I think Sweden kind of outplayed Canada a little bit. But uh, at the end of the day, it's the result that speaks for itself. And we won it. We got the heart. We did it. And the penalties were the most nerve wracking thing I think I've ever sat through. But it was amazing. The stress of that morning, I, you know, it was funny. My sister messaged me and she said, that must have been the most stressful morning at work I've had in a long time. <laughs> had Dude, nothing to do with work. It was um, killing me. It, it, two games where we go into penalties and it just felt like, you know, the stress, the edge. And you're right. You know, I think Sweden, let's tip our hat. Like they played a very, very good game today. Um, they were they so good. They could have come out with, with, a, with a win just the same, but, you know, the heart from our team, that moment of scoring that pen and turning that, that I don't know if you've seen the picture going around where, you know, uh, she's turning back to the team and the looks on their faces of is just one of those things where it, yeah. your body is completely in, in, a, in emotion. You don't even know what you're doing or what you're feeling uh, being caught up in that. What a moment. I, I I'm still kind of coming down from this high a little bit and I'm hoping that, you know, it doesn't go away for too long, but what was it like seeing Sinclair that was it, man. On. I cried. I'm not even gonna lie, man. I if, I was with my partner, and uh, we both were sitting here, and we just tears were rolling down our faces. If there is, a, if there was one member of the team, you know, if you're gonna single out somebody who's who's put in their heart, their the the of, of their career, they've put in the grind throughout different leagues, through different opportunities. You know, Christine Sinclair. What I like to say is that she's sort of. Um, She's there through her own will and effort as not a lot of uh, Canadian, you know, path to pro for women. She grinded it out. And to see her put that medal on, I couldn't think of anyone who deserved it, deserved it more. It was, it was a beautiful, beautiful. Yeah, it was, it's almost like a swan song kind of moment, you know, like she can't be much, much longer in the national team, not because we don't want her, but because she just had been put in so many years. And just to see her get that medal is, it, that's, oh, chills absolute chills i did see there was a tweet that she mentioned that she's planning to continue to play she said she would like to be in the next uh, you know uh women's world cup so let's just hope you know that that all lines up and we could see her uh you know maybe don a, another trophy uh, that would be before, incredible before the end of her career that would be uh that would be the beautiful way of, of ending it that would what was your biggest takeaway from the tokyo olympics this year was there a moment uh, other than the gold medal win obviously that really stuck with you that that you felt like hey this team has what it takes to make this a win taking america and actually like uh like rapini's comment about how she i don't know if you saw that she was saying that like canada she never i never lost to canada and some canadians kind of took it wrong uh i thought it was pretty amazing that like america still sees canada as an adversary even though we haven't like beaten them that much yeah, and I that, think that felt good. It felt good to see her, and, and I think that comment maybe people took it the wrong way a little bit. Me too. Because, I felt it respectful. Yeah, like I don't, I you know, if you watched the end of the game, you saw the interactions between Megan and through different members of the Canadian team, including Sinclair. And there's respect. There's nothing but respect between those girls. They hundred percent. Uh, do when they go out, do they want to beat the beat the crap out of the other team that they're playing? Absolutely, but they're all competitors and they have an incredible respect, I think, for that for that competitive edge. I think Megan's comment was really just you know the shock of the moment. The shock of the moment. She's never yeah, lost think, to Canada. That, it's it's that was it, I think. And and 
for those girls, you know, who grew up on the team losing to the Americans, this powerhouse of women's football for so long, to knock them out and go into that gold medal. I at that point I was saying, you know what? I know it's it's no one wants to root for second place, right? But a silver yeah. was going to be just just as much uh, of an achievement in that sense because we knocked off the Americans. We made that step that we had really struggled to take the past, you know, ten to twenty years. And upgraded the metal, right? So yeah, I would have been happy with the silver. Can't believe it. Still, still sort of. It's. I think I'm in shock a little bit. To be honest, it is. It is shocking. Like it, it's. I keep reminding myself, like we just won the gold medal in women's soccer. Like we're we we're on the top the gold of the medal hill right now. It's insane. <laughs> it's it's a great feel. Uh, Tedia mentioning that he uh, may or may not have cried tears of joy at his desk at work. He was glad no client came in during that. I mean, you could explain it. You know, Canada just won. Come and sit with me. Watch. Shout out to him, man. He's what a, what a guy. Yeah, Tedium. Tedium, if you don't know, great member of the Canadian soccer community, a big part of the Canadian soccer discord, which you should be a part of if you're not and you're a Canadian soccer fan and you have discord, why are you not in there? Be in there. Find the link. Google it. Respect. 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 respect exactly. Uh, so moving on to the next. I kind of wanted to pick your brain a little bit on on your love of, of football, uh, a yep. love of soccer. So um, we talked a bit about, you know, the account. We talked, obviously, about the Canadian women's team win this morning. But I'd love to dive into your love of the game. Where did that start? So yeah, where man. did you first kind of get into football? It's a, it was sort of a family thing. Like, uh, my family is kind of from the East Coast. And the East Coast has a pretty big soccer football scene going on there but it really really happened when uh i was hanging out with this hooligan uh who was a celtic hooligan and just it, it, it game over at that point you know when you get into the it was like an indoctrination it was just sort of like you understand the lifestyle and it was sold it's i was it's a hockey i was a hockey kid growing up to be honest and uh i don't know i just i guess kind of outgrew hockey it's it's interesting that you mentioned that because I'm I'm kind of feeling the same way over the last I'm I mean I got a Jets hat on for those who are watching, but <laughs> I, I grew up a hockey fan. I played hockey, you know, I, I dabbled a little bit in soccer when I was a kid, baseball, different sports. Were you kind of the same way? Did you did you kind of Yeah, that that was that was exactly it. And but like I so I grew up in like the suburbs and it it was very I don't know <laughs> ethnically uh one way and uh you know, when you when you get into football, suddenly now you have an access to more of your community or other communities, and I don't know. I always felt like an outcast in other sports, and now I'm not. It's it's interesting. Again, you mentioning that because that's something I think is is an astounding difference. Like if you go to a hockey game, you go to a hockey event, or even just participate in community hockey, you see the privilege is kind of attached with the sport. Like it's yeah. an expensive sport to play, not only just the registration fees, but the equipment, the travel, the tournaments, like it's a very expensive sport. Whereas I feel like when I go to a Valor game, you know, instead of a Jets game, I feel like it's much more of an accurate shot of what this country is made up of. And that, it's that, a variety of cultures. It's a variety of stories of places that they've come from. And there's nothing cooler than walking through a ground and seeing loads of different kits, like from all over the world. It's not just Canadian. It's so kits. amazing. That that really kind of it felt like you connected to something that was more than just this team's fan base. Do you know what I mean? It. Like it, I do get that 100 percent. And so when I first went to a Canadian Premier League game, I think that that same feeling you're describing is exactly what came over me. It's like I felt like I belonged. I felt like I felt like I yeah. was in this authentic place where people were welcoming and open. What was your first game that you attended? Did you feel something like that when you went? Uh, yeah. Uh, it was old firm. And it was amazing. <laughs> so did you? you obviously flew over. Yeah, uh, saw an old firm match. What, what what year was that, if you don't mind me asking? Uh, I don't know. It was a while ago, like twenty years ago. So what it was, was when Rangers were still Rangers. Rangers were still Rangers before they uh, had their uh, little uh, hiccup. Let's we'll say. <laughs> uh, and I don't want to get in too much trouble. I have some Scottish friends here, so I try to stay away from that old firm conversation as much as I can. It can bring up a lot of passion. But what was the game like attending? Like I'm imagining insane. sold out grounds, insane. dude. As a little Canadian kid, like little Canadian boy, you, you don't even, you don't understand. It was it was the next level. I mean, that's that's the dream. See see a, a stand 
filled to the brim, people chanting. Yeah, like fear, people no, it, it was, honestly, it was exhilarating because it was almost fearful. Like, you know, like there's <laughs> there, there, there a real element to it there. there. There's something that, like, I don't know, you're kind of scared the whole time. So that makes it more fun. Not that I condone any of that kind of stuff and I don't want it in here, but like when you want to go show someone a support, that's it was a very real moment. Yeah. There's there's an intensity level, right? Like we certainly don't want to see some of you know the you know, River Plate versus Boca, you know, exactly, Celtic yeah. versus Rangers. Like it can get toxic, but if you peel back that 10, 12 percent of the people who are maybe doing toxic things, the intensity that's there is a, a bit yeah, of an yeah. edge, right? Yeah, it's exhilarating. So you you got into you got into the old firm. Your your hooligan friend gets you into it a little bit. Yeah. Where, at what point do you start getting into Canadian football or Canadian Toronto soccer? Lynx. Toronto Lynx. Toronto Lynx. Tell us about the Toronto Lynx a little bit for those who don't know. Uh, they were a USL club. They were sort of a birth TFC. Um, they played a couple places in Toronto. Uh, U Sector actually, which is a big supporter group for TFC, I think, is based out of that. Um. Bunch of guys in CPLs like Matt Silva. He uh, he was on Toronto Lynx. Um, it was sort of the stepping stone that led to TFC, which then became my love after the Lynx kind of folded. And then uh, followed the TFC, followed the Lynx, and then now I'm in CPL. So it's interesting when we talk about Canadian, especially for those overseas, we'll always mention, oh, this team went defunct. Like this team disappeared. Yeah. Then I moved to this team, right? <laughs> it's something relatively unique to the North American kind of soccer and world. And Canadian landscape, man. Right? Like it's, you have to sort of grab a hold of these clubs and love them when they're there because you, you, the reality is it's been tough for some of these leagues to exist and to continue that. Um, Dude, and I used, to, like, I used to watch CSL, and like I, I followed a lot of CSL clubs, and they that's a pariah league. So the whole league then kind of folds. You know what I mean? Like you lose yeah. the whole league, not even just your team. I don't know. It's it's a weird experience to explain yeah, to someone, is. especially for for those overseas who are like, you know, a club is a club. It's part of this community. It's not something that can disappear. It's not something that can then, but it but it does happen. Yeah. But over here, it's just you go. I, I always say to people, go on Wikipedia. Look up the list of defunct North American soccer leagues. Look up the ones for in Canada, and just go through them because it's it's actually pretty incredible the amount of consistent effort that people are willing to put. Because I think, and you know, I, and I know, it's going to work eventually. It, it's the right. It's, it's it, right, man. That's it. And like you got to think too. Like we don't support clubs like like there's like the Metro Croatia or like I said now they're like Toronto Croatia or whatever. But like or Serbian White Eagles. Let's say Serbian White Eagles. Like they're a CFL club, they don't get nearly the respect they deserve because they're in CFL, but they've been around forever and they've been killing it. Like we ditch clubs so quickly here, and it sucks. And yeah, it, they, like, I don't know, yeah, it drives me nuts. And it's but it's interesting you mentioned the club because those Croatian Serbian clubs in the CFL are, are relatively well known overseas. People know huge, of them, right? Huge. Because but yet that league. You know, for those who don't know, the Canadian, like the, the CFL, not the 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 yeah, British soccer version, league. the Canadian Soccer League, the CSL is is not sanctioned by the federation. Is that correct? Yeah. So they uh, there was a match fixing issue that happened a bunch of years ago, um, and so the whole league was desanctioned, and that's what gave birth to League One. Like uh, after the desanction happened, a bunch of the clubs who were legit kind of went and formed League One. And like, like, and if, and we're still seeing some clubs move over. Like Roma Wolves were in CSL. Now Roma Wolves are in League One. So it, it's still the migrations are still happening. What do you think the ultimate? Like, what would your ideal end goal for the structure in Canada look like? Mm, tough man. Um, so one, we don't know if fucking there's franchise. Sorry. For, uh, no, it's okay. This, is, right, cool. this podcast is marked as explicit, so feel free to express yourself in any way you want. <laughs> Wonderful. I'm getting the beers in me. I'm still celebrating. Uh, yeah. So, uh, if, 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 if CPL, the franchise model, I don't know what they can do for Div 2. It's hard to sell someone a franchise and then say, maybe you're going to lose your spot. Mm -hmm. So, I'm cool with CPL being like an MLS in Canada and then having a Div 2 with Pro Rel. Uh, or in like, if, if, in my ideal world, it's like CPL's top. Div 2 is divided East and West Conference. Uh, the two winners of those get promoted. And then below that, it's all provincial leagues or like like hybrid provincial leagues, I guess, for some of the places that have lower population-wise. 
that's kind of how I've always thought of it is that, you know, the second tier is that kind of national East West, whatever split it is, your, your division yeah. two. And then you have these corner kind of already existing provincial leagues in most of the provin- provinces, not all, but some yeah. that would slot in quite naturally into that third, that third tier and give opportunities. Kind of these clubs. Yeah. Here, here's a question for you. Do you have a favorite club in Canada that most people don't know about? <laughs> like active or not active 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 uh yeah i mean and i'll ask you more. inactive too <laughs> all right i can definitely do inactive inactive very easy man edmonton aviators they the aviators. were US, yeah they were a usl club that had no chance like <laughs> they were they were <laughs> promised golden tickets to everybody they, they were playing commonwealth stadium and it was like a little team <laughs> There was no fit. It was huge. Uh, it was just nuts. The whole situation was nuts. They folded within like six months. The league took it over and then they rebranded. It's just wild. Uh, good story for anyone that wants to look that up. Steven Sander is the guy to message if you have any questions about him. He's a longtime Edmonton football reporter. Uh, when it comes to like, I guess, favorite club clubs, oh, it's tough. I do, I do really like Blaineville. I gotta say, I gotta say that they they're they're a heart and soul team. I I, I like I, I like Bond Azuri, but like I just don't like them because they're rivals in my League One club. But like Blaineville have been putting in the work for a long time, and they're they're a staple in the landscape. Uh, Ottawa St. Anthony, I'll shout out Ottawa St. Anthony as well. <laughs> they uh they actually beat Toronto Lynx uh in the amateur competition a long time ago. What I love is 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 I really did put you on the spot there, and we ended up with a couple, which is fantastic. It's, it just it, it shows the breadth of your knowledge, Spoon. Like you, you really do. Um, for those who don't follow CPL Wooden Spoon, please go on Twitter at CPL Wooden Spoon. Give him a follow and start scrolling because he actually will drop a lot of little bits of hey, you should check out this account, or you should look into this club, or hey, check out this picture. Like it's 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 nice to see that their history goes way farther back than we give it credit for. And one of the things I think, you know, Canada has, uh, you know, living here, we talked a bit about, you know, you grow up a hockey fan, you sort of have to, in a way, be stubborn not to be a hockey fan. Um, But the the thought that I'm getting to here is, is we, we, it seems to, in the hockey world, if I'm a Jets fan, and you're an, a Leafs fan, the banter immediately starts, and it's a very different situation. Whereas if yep. you're a York fan, I, I, I'm just going to say, I guess, York fan or, or Atletico fan or Halifax, and I'm like, oh, I'm a Valor fan. Yeah, we're going to have a little bit of friendly banter, but at the same time, there's almost an allegiance. There's almost an allyship of, hey, we're in the same league. We want the same thing. And we we there's a, a, a love in a sense of, hey, you and me, we're the same. We may not cheer for the same club, and I'm not gonna like when you beat me, but hey, we're buddies. Like, let's have a beer. Let's go watch the game. Let's talk about it. Right? Like that, exactly. That's I, that, that. That's what makes it beautiful. That's what the sport is so beautiful. The only exception to that rule is TFC Montreal. <laughs> Tell us about that. Have you gone to a TFC Montreal match? What is what is it like going to those games? I've never been to an MLS derby. So close to the firm games, man. Like pretty close. I'm pulling off my sticker. I'm pulling off my TFC stickers off my car just so I don't want anyone smashing my window. They are nuts. They're good. I mean, there's there's a level there's a level of like friendly banter. Then there's a level of like a bit angry drunk banter. And then there's like ultras who are like meet in the parking lot. <laughs> it's it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds intense and a, like a load of fun. Like I, I, the away days, being able to take the train, you know, drive up yeah. Montreal, whatever it is, that must be really really nice. I mean, as as a Winnipegger, we're sort of in the middle of nowhere, and to be able to see an away game, it's it's a much longer trip, much more of a planned out exercise. Yeah. Um, how many derby games like that have you gone to? Oh, I don't know. Can't count, man. Can't count. <laughs> are you? A, to... Are you I'm a not member a member of one of the supporters? No, I, I, I have zero affiliations with any club or any team. So you're purely Canada Can first. I'm here for everybody. Let's go. I'm here for yeah. I'm here for the history. I'm here for the the matches. I'm here to just celebrate that we have this. Because ten years ago we didn't even have this. Yep, yep. I think that's another thing that people often forget. And I, you know, myself when I first you know got into football manager, then got into football and, and really became the addict that I am now, I didn't realize how young some of these TFC, you know, like the TFC club is relatively young. 
in, yeah. in terms of, of, you know, you look back at the history of the sport, it's very young. It's a junior team in that sense. It's still young, still growing and they've had success and, you know, obviously they're struggling now, but, um, that's a club that has really done a great job building that atmosphere, building the, the support around that team. Because when I watch it on TV, that it looks as close to as you're going to get in terms of that European yep. vibe. I want to plug. Uh, I want to plug something for Josh Cloak. Uh, he got a book called "Come On, You Reds: uh, History of TFC." Highly recommend to everyone watch it if you or read it. Sorry, if uh, if you want to know a little bit about Canadian football, it's incredible. And it also had the connections to like CPL because Paul Bernier and stuff was he, he was at TFC before you launched the league. Uh, the way that they interacted with supporters to get a real deal, like uh, it's it's incredible. TFC, I, I know that there are there's sort of a divide sometimes in CPL's community about anti MLS because it's an American league, blah blah blah. But CPL wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the MLS teams. Yeah, and I think that's fair. Like, it's something I've noticed too, is that there is a little bit of divide, a little bit of uh, you know CPL versus MLS, especially the first year or two. But I'm yeah. starting to see that fade a little bit because yeah, I think dude, it's, seriously fading because now the loans and stuff are happening. Right, like I think people didn't realize that you know, and maybe I'm making the wrong assumption here, but I felt like maybe some thought the Canadian Premier League was being set up to directly compete with the MLS. Yeah, and I think. From my understanding, I never looked at it that way. I, I looked at it as a chance that we were going to kind of grow underneath them. Yeah. And maybe one day we'll have that conversation again, you know, 10, 20 years from now. But right now they're in a very, in a much bigger league that's well established. I never the way I look at them. it, man, I look at it like MLS is EPL and CPL is the Scottish Premier League. We got our, we got our Calvary, we got our Forge, they're Celtic Rangers. They're yeah. Celtic Rangers. And uh, then to, you got, a TFC that's like EPL, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah, it's it, it's it's interesting because I always I never really bought into that narrative of like, oh, you're MLS, like, ooh, yeah, you know exactly. what I mean? like, like for me, like one of the things that me and my buddy would love to do, the guy that I sit uh, at every Valor game with, is we we've been wanting to go down and see a Minnesota game just because of their new ground. Like, I want to sit in the corner three feet from someone and not sit 10 feet up and back dude and bit, shout out I mean? minnesota because they had the flyover cup with fc edmonton way way back in the day when uh that i don't know if you've ever heard of the flyover cup no I never you. yeah you should look it up it's uh back in the nassau days uh it, it was the cup because fc edmonton helped minnesota when they had i forget what i forget what the two problems were but uh, there was some sort of crisis, and FC Edmonton raised some funds for them, and then they raised some funds for Edmonton when there were some wildfires. So they started this cup called the Flyover Cup, and uh, yeah, it's pretty pretty interesting. Like you, the the way Canada has impacted other clubs that you see in MLS, and you don't even realize it, is part of the problem that we. That's sort of why I'm here, is to try to make sure. It, that, that, I mean, it's not on the fault of anyone. You know what I mean? I don't think it's like ignorance or lack of knowledge or care from the Canadian fans. It's just. Yeah, it's, but that's but you're you're hitting a note there too, right? I think that there's also, you know, I, I think there's a lot of people who've jumped into the Canadian Premier League or gone to games who are also relatively new and are comfortable. That's saying, it, yeah. I'm new, you know, like I'm new. What do I do? Like, where do I sit? Like, how, how does this work? Like, I'll tell you a little story, Spoon. Totally honest. Me and my buddy, when we first bought seats, we really didn't know where to sit. Like, we yeah. didn't really have an idea. And I hadn't really talked to Nikki from Red River Rising. You know, shout out to shout Red out Nikki fantastic supporter group here in winnipeg um and so we bought seats right in the middle of the ground facing you know like right at like at the center and we were sitting there with you know families and folks but it wasn't the supporters yeah. group people were just kind yeah. of chatting and we we ended up actually getting a couple of folks so we were chatting along with the supporters which were further down and we're singing along vfc vfc and I had a couple of folks turn and go shh can you keep yeah. it down please and we were like hey this isn't what we signed up for. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And um, that's the struggle of the league. Like, uh, so I, I go to York games because I'm, I'm close to there. It's like I was sitting near their supporter section the other day, and they put families in the supporter section, I guess, because they couldn't sell tickets. And it was just not a good scene. Yeah, it's, it's something I think also the clubs need to learn, right? Is that we're used to, you know, in North America, everyone sits wherever they want. You can have supporters yeah. mixed, all that kind of stuff. And it, I think, once you realize what type of fan you are in the sense of like, do I want to sit in the supporter spot? And then when I'm in the supporter seat, do I want to be at the front? Cause I'm going to be intense the whole time. Or I'm going to sit back a little bit. Cause I'm going to be standing with my beer or I'm going to be right at the back. Cause I want to see everything. Right. Like 
we didn't realize where we belonged. And once we found that spot, you're surrounded by people who all are in the same intense level that you are. And it's just this family. And like, how amazing is that feeling? Like that is, that's, that's what I love about the game, man. Like you don't get that in hockey. You don't get that in baseball. You know, <laughs> you, you find your spot in the stadium when it comes to football. And you, and you see the same people. Whereas I went to Jets games, you know, uh, my dad had season tickets. And every time I went, it was a different group because everybody's selling their tickets around. Like you have yeah. 80, you have 40 some games a year. Yeah. You know, you miss a few here and there. Whereas it's like Valor, I'm going to be there every game. I'm counting it down until they come home. I know they were home for the bubble, but didn't get a chance to see them when they were here. So I'm counting it down. I'm, I'm, I might have a little tear when I walk into that ground. I'm hey, man. And like the way it spreads, too. I watched my first Bombers game. I never watched CFO once. I watched Bombers versus Ticat the other day because of Valor. So yeah, it's, it's funny how it ends up all connecting together, right? Um, I'm just I'm just thinking about one of the first like the first season was such a mix of experiences for us as Valor fans because we there's a lot of downs in some of the games but we were still like incredibly hyped that we had this team we were we were bought in. Did you go to York games that first season? What was your Yeah, was yeah. Your I, uh, yeah, I'm I'm near York. So uh, I've gone to all the the York games, York York 9 I guess before. Um yeah, no, I'm good, man. Uh I shout out to Gen 9, Gen 9 they 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 brought it and that atmosphere is missing this year. Uh, it was intense. I never went to go near them, but they they brought a big party atmosphere. I think York got it wrong with the branding. I I don't know about the new branding, but we'll see how it goes. I was just gonna ask about that actually because you know I have a. Uh... The York Nine, obviously, there was some memes around, you know, Yorkie, and and I think some of those things are fun. Like I, I I'm not taking yeah, me too. Out you know, I, I, you know, I, I want Yorkie to come back. I love <laughs> that guy, man. Like he came out, he was spooky, and then as time passed, we were all like, "Where's Yorkie? I miss Yorkie. I want Yorkie back." Like, <laughs> yeah, like, he's the one thing they need to bring back. What What do you think they got wrong with that rebrand? Did, did they need to rebrand at all in the first place? Ah, uh, tough man. Uh, they needed to rebrand if they wanted to hit the Toronto market, which I've I've heard that that most of their season tickets were in Toronto. The problem and why I've heard why Gen Nine isn't part of it anymore is that they promised themselves the York Region Club, and while York Region doesn't have sort of an identity itself, the club was supposed to be what brought about that identity, and then just kind of bail on it after two years. I can understand being a little bit heated about that. Yeah, and I and then just as a you know far away observer, I also think this at tagging on United is kind of lazy. I hate, I hate it's it. Kind of it, lazy, you know, like. It's but it's, just... it's not even United because United usually means the clubs that have united. Like yeah. it comes from multiple clubs coming together. I don't know. Uh, it, it just. I will say like... I do. I, I do have. I do have the jersey. I love that. I love that new kit that they have there. Their away kit. So. Yeah, the new kits are really, really nice. I, I feel like the white one with the striping really just, it feels like an old school kind of Portugal jersey or something from the Portuguese. That one feels Portugal and the other one feels French to me. Yeah, yeah, actually. Yeah, absolutely. And and I actually really like their dark, I'm, but I'm always a sucker for dark kits. Like you can throw yeah, a dark too. kit in front of me and, and nine times out of 10, I'll go, yep, I'll take that. And I drink a lot of coffee, so I don't want to spill it on my white <laughs> kit. <laughs> right? That's painful. That's painful. So... What are you looking forward to uh, the rest of the year here for the Canadian Premier League? Are you are you looking forward to uh, maybe York turning around, surprising folks, moving up to the top of the table? I mean, are you looking yes. forward to Valor regaining, you know, the top of the league? What is, what is it you're looking forward to? <laughs> I, I, I I do really love the Valor. Like, shout out to Rob Gale, man. He he got his shit two years going. People didn't respect that man as much as they should have. And he's finally started getting it now. So shout out Rob Gale. Uh, I do love the Valor, the Valor sort of story. Uh, sure, if York could kill it. I'd also be happy. Uh, I don't think they will. I don't think that they're the club looking to do that. I think that they're looking to be a selling team right now. I think they have to try to recoup costs. Um, I am excited for the Forge Concacaf League storyline because they blew it last year. They had three shots. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> missed all of them. So we'll see what's happening there. Uh, Calvary's an interesting one because, like, they came out swinging and sort of seemed to middle of the packet. And uh, obviously, Bustos, man. Bustos is what a guy. What else can you if, say? I, I mean, for me, it's whenever I see Bustos, like, there's two thoughts one, what a player, and B, 
man, we had him on our team. <laughs> oh, did, you, did you did you see Pacific's tweet on uh, uh, the the Ballard like social media when they did the messy ones? Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. so good. That was yeah. So I, good. I, there's another thing that we need to talk about actually before we go. The social media teams in this league, for the most part, are pretty good. Are really good. Like Valor, I think Valor Valor's the best by far. I think I was just gonna say, I'm like, I'm not trying to be biased, but I think Valor no, those two years of so taking far. the piss from everybody else, yeah, they were taking notes, right? Like they were getting ready for like when there's gonna be a year, we're gonna remember this and we're gonna drop some great content. Dude, and even like the the emojis or like not emojis, the gifts and stuff of like Gale, like dude, your team, <laughs> like Valor. I don't know. I love Valor. They're my second team. I'll I'll say that right now on the podcast. You got me here. Valor's love it. My second team. Love it. I mean, Nikki would love to hear you. you whenever you come out here, we'll we'll throw a, a spoon mask on you. No one will know who you are, and you can come <laughs> hang out with us. All right. Wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's uh, it, I I'm so excited to get back to that ground. It's hard for me not just to keep wanting to talk about that, but yeah. Um, we talked about, about, we talked a little bit about the champions league. There's another unique kind of interesting situation. I think in Canadian premier league, I can't speak for every fan, but I know the fans around me, you know, we don't care which team, obviously we'd love our team to be there, but if there's a Canadian premier league team and we go for it, we're behind them a hundred percent. Um, so what I I see in there, I love it. Like I I want, I want them to win. I want them to do well. I want them to remind the rest of, uh, CONCACAF where we're how uniquely Canadian is that? Like, I love, like, that's what I was saying earlier about like the banter is like, like, I'll I'll talk shit about your team until they have a chance to do something. My team can't. And then I'm all aboard yours. And I I think that might go away eventually, but I don't think anytime in the near future. And I don't want it to go away, to be honest. Like I, I love I love that we all unite as like a force. You know, it's like it's like first it's CPL versus MLS, and then when MLS gets to the Champions League, then it's like, all right, well, MLS now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, it, it's it's. I want people to remember that the, the Canadian soccer has a place. That's that it. Here and that we're Amen, not going man. away. It's only going to be getting better. And I think That's one of the is. things that really I loved about the Gold Cup, as much as that Mexico result was incredibly infuriating, is that. Mexico we knows we're here now. Yeah, we showed up. <laughs> you know, it's not a game that they can, you know, think about casually when they go into those qualifiers. Canada is going to be dangerous. Canada is going to be on them. And there's a lot of talent in this country and it's youthful. So just yeah. be ready. Be ready. I was reading a, a thing earlier today about how, like, should Americans start uh, respecting Canada rather than being like, oh, hey, good for you guys. Like, you got here. Like, could we just keep killing them? <laughs> no, I want them to respect us forever. Just show the love. <laughs> But that being said, I, I I have you know I have a few friends who are U.S. Uh, national team fans, and I have to say most of them have been really loving and respectful of of what our teams accomplished. I'm sure that'll go away in time. You know, oh, as yeah. if, if we continue to do well, it'll be a bit more sour. Like, oh, can you guys just stop doing that? You know, that kind of thing. But I'm looking forward to that anyway. Question in the chat here for you from Tedium: Who is your player to watch this year? Oh. Ferrari, Max Ferrari, not that the uh, York nine bias or York nine bias, but uh, dude, look at Max Ferrari. That kid is the kid, and he is just destroying it. He might not be getting the goals and stuff, but the way he plays is just pure intensity. Cool. Uh, next question, yellow. Uh, well, not even a question, more of a comment. Now, yellow sweaty gorilla says. Where else do fans follow five to six games a week, all of the teams becoming our team? I don't mind the sport returning <laughs> to a place where that doesn't happen, but right now I'm savoring all of this football. Like it, That's nailing it on the head there. That uh, is nailing sure. it on the head, yeah. Yellow Sweaty Gorilla. It's it's like I'm looking shout forward out to Ed. Yeah, Big shout out to Ed. And every time Zed here, I'm going to mention it. This man creates my 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 dream fm database every year puts together the canadian premier league database and, and a huge a, part of the pfa or like the supporter group for the pfa like guys killing it huge huge part of the pfa and and a guy that i'm constantly trying to entice to come on the show but we'll see we'll, we'll eventually see um <laughs> i don't even remember what we were talking about but that it was that it's that it's that love of the sport that I think is all, and I, I hope that never goes away. As much Me as there's going to be more banter and there's going to be more, you know, back and forth, I hope that the love of the sport continues to grow. And I think that yeah, we do. All you got to do is look at the amateur signups in this country, and you're seeing basketball and soccer. Those yeah. are the two that are growing. They're the most accessible sports. Are there issues still in terms of cost? Yeah, absolutely, there is. Um, 
but that's something that I think, you know, in time we're going to, we're going to be able to address and do better. Yeah, so. I agree. So before we, 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 we leave off here, um, where can people connect with you these days, uh, Spoonie? I know we've talked about the Twitter account, so CPL yeah. Wooden Spoon. Is there anywhere else that people can connect with you? Uh, I mean, I'm on the Discord pretty often. Um, I'm pretty pretty approachable on Twitter or Discord, so if anyone has any questions or anything like that, just hit me up. Sounds great. Sounds great. Big thank you for coming on the show today, buddy. I really, Thanks really do appreciate it. Uh, love the background. For those who are, are listening to, to, the, uh, to, the, to the podcast, He's got a lovely wooden spoon award, a couple of nice scarves on the side. The man is a spoon. Let's give him the love he deserves. Thank you so much for being here, CPL Wooden Spoon. We really appreciate your time, and uh, thank you again for being here. Appreciate it, man. Thank you. Enjoy your beers. Enjoy the vibes. Canada, number one women's team. Let's go. Will do, man. All right. Talk soon. See ya. So that was CPL Wooden Spoon, a Twitter account, a man of mystery, a Canadian soccer uh nut he, he's a, he's all sorts of things a historical knowledge is is crazy thank you for being here cpl wooden spoon really really do appreciate you jumping in without further ado we're going to jump into the next interview which i'm going to be totally honest i'm a little nervous i'm interviewing jose galan one of the most favorite valor fc pl players here in winnipeg we're really excited to have him on for those who don't know jose he started it the uh, Atletico Madrid Academy. He's traveled throughout the world for his career, loads of different clubs, loads of different countries. The experiences that he's had, I would just like to pick his brain a little bit, see uh, see what we can learn, what his experiences were like, and uh, have a chance to, to, to get to know him a little bit better. So without further ado, let's go ahead and bring in Jose. Jose, how are you? Can you hear me? Yes. What? Yeah. Hey, let me see what is this. I should put it like this. Better. Either, either way works great. Thanks so much for taking the time today, Jose. I really do appreciate it. No, I appreciate that you always are in Twitter in the different uh, uh, media accounts like uh, Instagram, whatever, uh, supporting and uh, cheering up for us. So I really appreciate all your support. And of course, uh, when you invite me, I cannot say no to extend your, <laughs> your new show. Hey, you know what? You're too nice. You could have said no. I would have been. I would have been totally okay with it. But hey, thank you so much for your time today, and uh, appreciate you taking the time. I know that you're probably in the midst of a lot of different things, so uh, you know we're 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 loving that you're here. Um, so before we we get started, for those who don't know you, you know you play in the Canadian Premier League. You've been a footballer for it looks like most of your life. I'd love to talk a little bit about you know, where you grew up and your, your first touch and your first love with the sport. Um, what was your first memory of, of football, Jose? Well, my first memory was to play um, uh, in my in my village, especially in summer. All the, the boys were uh, there out of the city, out of like a kind of a village uh, that people go there for, for summer. And I was always uh, was the, the, the youngest one um probably the shortest as well so that helped me a lot to develop my game you know when you have to fight against the kids who are uh three four five years older than you one of them was my brother who is three years older than me you have to develop that skills no and another strength so i think it helped me a lot and all the time i was playing soccer uh, in my city i was already a kind of known because of the people call me I don't know if you remember the series. I don't know how it's actually the name in English. Oliver Atom, you know the series, uh, uh, Japanese Japanese uh, series of of, uh, of soccer. And because they always see me with a ball on my hand when I was 10, 11, 8 years old playing, they say, look, here is Oliver again, you know? And it was kind of funny, uh, my love for the game. Uh, until I got a spot from a coach in a, event in a tournament when I was uh, 10 years old in my village, as I mentioned before, he spotted me and he uh, scouted me and, and called me for the for the main team of my hometown. So that was my, my first memory of playing. I, I think it was around eight years old, yeah, nine, something like that. 
That's that's really incredible to think that you're only eight years old and here you are being identified. People in the village know you. They've got a nickname for you. That's really, really cool. Tell us a little bit about your village, where you grew up. What was it like growing up there? What, what was the, the town like? What was the size like? What was your day to day like? Yeah, um, uh, actually, I was born in Leon, which is a um, uh, really, really beautiful city, historical city in the north of Spain. Um, my my childhood it was always uh it sounds like typical no but it was um with a ball around playing soccer anytime i have uh finished my homework and running i remember it was funny because my uh, we have like a four against four field okay uh, it was a public place and you just pick your team and go there and you place who the team who you, who wins stay no it's two goals and it yeah. stays and it was a huge like uh, for us uh, on that age again we play against people even 16 years old 17 and i was only maybe 10 11. so um if you lose you have to stay maybe out of the of playing for one hour or one hour yeah. half. so you have to be really competitive not to lose and even on that age again we my team or a couple of players like we we won and we're kind of the best team there and <laughs> And again, uh, I think it helped me a lot uh, to develop my competitive uh, competitive level. And it was funny because when I finished the homework and my mother said, okay, then you can go. I was, instead of going walking, I take like 20 minutes. I, I, went, uh, I went there running just to not miss even some minutes to play. And that could be a sum up or a resume of my love for the game. Even since I was a really child, always my, I was focused on, on being a professional footballer. Uh, when I was 12 years old, I got selected for like national team of, of uh, Spain. Um, my parents only focus on myself. Like it's so difficult to play football. Uh, so just focus on on a, and on a study. Uh, they didn't care too much about football, even if they didn't like the, the game, but they only care about the study. Study is so difficult to, to make it professional. It's impossible. You're not going to make it. There are so many good kids are around there um at the same time they told me that so many times like 13 14 years old when i was 13 they offered me contract for valencia for real valladolid i was close to sign even being a real ch a child you know with 13 years old but my parents didn't allow me they told me now you have to focus first on the on your studies um it helped me to finish my studies of psychology i have a degree of psychology but at some times, kind of motivation because my parents didn't trust on me. Like they say, oh, it's di very difficult. It's here in Spain. There are so many talent players. So it was like, okay, you know what? So I'm going to make it. So you always tell me your study is so difficult, blah, blah, blah. So I was kind of a stubborn to make my dream and to say, okay, I, I, I will show you that I can do both things. Like I can play uh, football in a professional level and at the same time I can study a, a degree. And I think it's really amazing sitting here, you know, years later, here you are, you are a professional footballer and you also have your psychology degree, which is, which is pretty, pretty incredible um, to think about the amount of time it would take to do those things at the same time. So you, you're getting scouted. What, at what point does Atletico Madrid get in contact with you? At what point do you hear from that club? Well, when I was 15 years old, they already contacted me. Some of the best teams in Spain, the Portugal, La Coruña, Espanol, uh, Villarreal. But um, the thing is that my hometown team, uh, in that time, they were like trying to 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 get the team in a professional level. They were in second division B, which is the third tier in Spain. They wanted to promote. They have a, a great project ahead. And they told me, no, we don't uh, allow you to go, which is a little bit uh, with 15 years old, it was my dream to play in a in a team like Atletico Madrid or those teams I mentioned, but they didn't allow me, and it was kind of disappointing for a uh, age of of a boy of this age, you know. But uh, then the best person of the team they told me, okay, we don't allow you to go now, but uh, if in two years we are not in first division of Spain in La Liga, we let you go when you are 16, 17 years old, and I said, okay. So I, I kept playing there and with 17 years old, they didn't promote. Unfortunately, because I really, that's my first team I always, it's not Real Madrid, Atletico Madrid. My first team is Cultural Leonesa, which is the, my hometown team. 
um, but they didn't promote and that guy because uh, other people on the board didn't allow me even after that promise to go. But this guy is the, the brass person and say, I gave my word to this guy and to his father. So now we didn't promote, so I let you go. And in that time, to be honest with you, I pick up Atletico Madrid, not because of the professional side that, of, of course, um, it was an important side, but because in Madrid, I could select or pick any uh, degree I, I wanted. Okay. Some, I don't know, in, in La Coruña, there were some degrees that you cannot study there. So in Madrid, you have all the options. Um, and that's why I chose I chose, um, I chose uh, Atletico Madrid. And it was a perfect decision because we have an amazing team. And the first year I, I played there, we we beat Real Madrid for more than 11 points in La Liga. So we were the best team, uh, like the favorite team for winning the Spanish Champions uh, League in, the, in that moment with 17, 18 years old. But there was a player called Messi in that time that uh, <laughs> came into our way and we were drawing the game to two and and he scored two goals. Uh, we, we lost for two, and and we couldn't win the championship. But um, I start to realize what is a professional environment with 16, 17 years old when I signed there for Atletico Madrid. Yeah. I mean, what an experience, and what a quick quick way to be thrown into a very professional environment with a lot of players who are, you know, well known to this day. What what was your biggest memory from your time at Atletico Madrid? Um. Uh, probably I will say that uh, the game against Real Madrid, uh, my family, my brother, my father are really, really Real Madrid supporters. And we played that away. It was so important game uh, for us. And I scored one goal uh, and then I gave the assist of the other. Um, I still keep the memories, the, the pitcher taking the jersey off, you know, and for that age, uh, making impact in that game, big game for us, uh, being under under 18 years old against Real Madrid was always was my my team also when I was a child, I was super Real Madrid. So it was kind of an incredible moment. But after that, I would say also uh, with the 18 years old, um, I was called by the reserve team of Atletico Madrid, which is called Atletico Madrid B, which is not normal. Normally, the players there, they are 20, 21, 22, 23, even years old. And I was only 18 and the, the coach uh, saw something on me. It was Pepe Murcia. Uh, right now he's coaching in Qatar. Um, and I always said he trusts on me a lot. Uh, he gave me a lot of trust to being called like uh, uh, Atletico Madrid B in that moment. So those two are probably my biggest memories uh, in that time. And so you mentioned that you had chosen Madrid as well, so you could you could choose whatever kind of degree you wanted. Did you finish your psychology degree while you were at Atletico Madrid, or was that something that took a few more years? No, it took uh, took much more years because <laughs> then I sent for Almeria. Oh, oh, uh, again, I I chose Almeria instead of Deportivo La Coruña or Sporting de Gijón because Almeria have the psychology degree, so I could I could continue to study there, and they just promote to to La Liga. Um, so I finished the, the degree um, before I start my career uh, abroad there in, in Almeria, yeah. Question for you on the psychology degree. Do you think that the psychology degree has helped you as a professional athlete in terms of your ability to kind of handle stress or understand how the mind works? Mm, I, I hope it was going to help me, but I, 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 I tell you it didn't. <laughs> I, I, I always see... I even uh, work with some uh, sports psychologists in my career. Where I think it's really important and really helped me. In Spain, probably, I don't know, now it's something like 20 years ago, nobody uh, worked with a psychology, but now most of the sportsmen, individual sports and even uh, uh, collective uh, or team sport like football, I can tell you that Valencia, Betis, like most of the teams uh, work with a psychologist. Um, but to study in, uh, to the study the, the the degree, I always try to, yeah, okay, I see things, and then okay, I can I can do this in football. But I would say I always see the problems um, in others. Like okay, this is easy. I, I speak to them, I give my advice. But when it's your own theme, is it's most difficult not to 
to do it. Um, I don't really think, to be honest with you, that it, it helped me through my career. Um, even that I think my best attribute being a footballer is the resilience. I never give up. I never, so many obstacles in my career and I never give up, but I don't think it's because of the uh, studying a psychologist. The I, I was just curious because it is, like you mentioned, it's something that's more of a standard staff, you know, involvement at some of those, those top level clubs. You have sports psychologists now, right? So you talked a little bit about your time at Elmira, and I'm sure I'm saying it wrong. So apologies, I'm trying to pronounce it correctly. But um, you were actually coached by uh, Unai Emery. What was that like? Uh, well, actually, yeah, I signed with a four person at uh, Almeria that uh, I sent for a second team, which it was in the rest of team also in second division B. Um, but uh, uh, the team in La Liga, have already a great players like Negredo and Emery was the coach. The first game we play like rest of team against against uh, first team. Same thing we happened a uh, long time uh, the years before with Atletico Madrid that I play against Simeone was a steel player that uh, speak a little bit how old I am like I'm really old <laughs> because uh, Simeone was still a, a player not a coach. Um, and it kind of um, get me disappointed because Aguero on that time it was my age and he was already playing the, in the first team of Atletico Madrid. So sometimes when you're in Atletico Madrid, you think, oh, I'm a, in Spain we're like that, oh, I'm a big player, I'm going to make professional, I'm an Atletico Madrid, is the one of the best teams in, in Spain. But uh, let me tell you, from 22 players with 18 years old already, that you are already a developed player, I think we made professional career maybe five. So it's not that easy. And when you see a word on that level, you say, okay, I think I'm still far away of that level. <laughs> I should be in a better level. He's with 17, he's even younger than me. He's performing in La Liga. So when I uh, signed for Almeria, I said, okay, I need to make a step forward. Um, you are not a kid anymore. And, and yeah, I start to play, to, to, to turn with this reserve team. But the first chance we got against the La Liga team with Emery was the coach. Uh, we play a friendly game, and I think, uh, uh, yeah, Emery saw something in me that uh, he put me after that uh, game. Uh, he called me after the game. Uh, I got a fight against Felipe Melo. Uh, he was playing there in the midfielder, a Brazilian player, amazing CV. He played national team of uh, Brazil. He played Juventus, Fiorentina, so it was kind of big. Um, um when we fight in the in the game like i was still a child a young player and i didn't come back you know like i facing i didn't get fear i think that fight about my personality or whatever remedy so something in me also my game and after that day he told me hey, i want this guy with the first team training every day um, and there i started everything for Almeria. uh, uh Four year, amazing four years. Probably, I would say my peak of my career. Uh, the best football I always play in my life. I, I, I think. So from there, you know, you played a lot of games uh, at Elmira, and I, like you mentioned, it was it was, you know, playing, getting number twenty eight, wearing it in La Liga. What a memory, right? Like incredible. And then you actually end up over. You head over to Indonesia. I think is next. Is that correct? Or where do you go next? No, Thailand. Thailand, Thailand, right. Okay, so we went to Thailand next. What brought you to Thailand? What enticed you to go to Thailand? Well, um, I got a um, ACL tour in the moment, I could say, the most Im the important moment of my career because Emery was gone, who was Sanchez, the Mexican legend, also was there as coach. He called me for precision, but in that moment I was already, I passed uh, 23 years old, I was 24. And there is like a rule in Spain that uh, you cannot go back and forth from the second team to the first when you are above 30, 23. So they have to select if uh, uh, Canton was me with the second team or with the first. And uh, and uh, Hugo Sanchez say, oh, no, I want this guy for the precision. For me, it's part of the first team. So it was a huge team for me. But after that precision, I tore my ACL. Same injury that uh, Andrew Jean Baptiste. But I want to say, actually, through your program, 
like uh, send him his strength because he's at home and and he's such an important person and player for for valor um but yeah that's a very very bad injury the worst i got in my career uh you know you are, you know that you're gonna be more than six eight months out of the, on the field and it killed my my moment i finished my contact with almeria so after that moment it was the decision i said okay um I want to play uh, abroad. Um, I decided to finish my career. Sorry, I, I got a call in the phone. Yeah, no, so it's okay, maybe. no worries. Uh, yeah, I got you. There we are. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, no so, so yeah, so I, I decided to go abroad. Um, in the in the first moment, I, I I wanted to go to Hungary. There was one team interested in me. It's called Salagesser, but one ex teammate from Atletico Madrid was playing there, and he told me they were not getting paid. Uh, can, the players were making a, a strike because they were not getting paid. So I said, "Oh, I have to change my plans." And I heard about Thailand. Uh, one agent told me about the about the league there, and I start to to share around internet. Uh, the stadiums, the league uh, so, uh, impressed me, even the level. So I decided to to win there, and and I start my my journey uh, out of Spain. So, what was it like living in Thailand? Like, was it tough without having the language? Was it was it a tough start there in terms of just getting to know people and and settling in? Yes, it was the toughest part, as you mentioned, is the language. Oh, okay, I'm not. Uh, I'm not. The, I have not a perfect English, but I can communicate myself. But there, from I don't know, 20 for 23 players, uh, I think two, three kind of speak kind of a little bit of English, but don't try even to don't dare to put a verb in the past because they don't, they kind of understand you. So instead of improving my English, I think it probably went worse than in Thailand <laughs> trying to communicate. But it was tough because you feel like kind of uh, alone. There sometimes you are you have teammates, but the language um, not being able to communicate with them is tough. I try to improve or to learn Thai. In that year and a half I played there, I think I at the end I could communicate in in Thai. But it was a big big uh, change. Uh, getting used to a professional level, we have uh, luckily in Spain how the football is in uh, Atletico Madrid, in Almeria, and then that big change to Thailand where it's professional football but something that you see they are so so different uh comparing with spain it was a, a big and difficult time for me my my first year abroad i think it was in time was my uh, more difficult also with the food i don't know uh, before uh a game with spicy food <laughs> uh, i have a, a, um, a funny story my debut there in time i have to ask for the substitution because the spicy food didn't work well, well, well and good on me. So after 70 minutes, I have to ask for the sub and go straight to the to the locker room. You you can guess why. Um, so yeah, it was it was tough. Uh, it's uh, a lot of a lot of knowledge, a lot of improved improvement, especially as person. Um, it was it was good, but at the same time tough to be so far of your family and I'm feeling sometimes like uh, yeah kind of loneliness there because you are alone uh, for 15 months. I, I couldn't spend even Christmas with my family, which really time that in Spain or of course here in Canada, everybody feel like going uh, uh, um, back home and stay with my parents, with my with my family, with my with my friends. But this is what uh, some side that people don't know about uh, being a professional sportman, uh, about a professional footballer, uh, but OK. At the end, is knowledge, is improvement, and, and tough, but uh, another experience. So I have a question for you from the chat here. So I'm gonna bring, I'll bring it up here for you here quickly. Uh, question for Jose: I am a Hong Konger, so I was very excited when I saw someone who had played in the HKPL had signed in the Canadian Premier League. I was wondering how you find the standard of football compares between Asia, Hong Kong in particular, and the Canadian Premier League. Are there different styles in play? 
Uh, I've been very impressed with how players from Asian leagues like Muro Fushi and those uh, you have done in the league. And I hope more players from Asia are signed. So a big question, but what was your, your experience and what was the, 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 the difference in play like between Hong Kong and, and Canada? Well, Hong Kong, first of all, is an amazing, an amazing country. It's one of my top three of countries where I live. Uh, it's an amazing place. And the football, I think it's underestimated there because um, uh, people here in Hong Kong, I don't think at all about football, but there were good footballers there, um, good foreigners players there, and the level of football was better than I expected. Not uh, the stadiums, and the supporters are not that good. I mean, they are not like in Thailand, Indonesia, where you play with 20,000 people, 30,000, 40,000. Still, uh, in Hong Kong, it's not like the main sport. It's not that famous, the league there. Kind of a little bit like Canada. Still, I still have to improve. Not to improve. There are a lot of supporters, in my opinion, for only three years of, of life. But I think there is love for, for, for the sport. But um, when I see yesterday image, for example, IG Field, and I see the Bombers, I feel jealous. I say, wow, yeah. don't we have here this for valor? Because I think there are a lot of people who love soccer. But even here in the city, I meet some people on, oh, there is a team here in the league, I didn't know, in the Winnipeg. So there is still, uh, I don't know, uh, people don't know still like they about CPL and I hope they, I don't know the country, the TVs, the the cities, the hell more to 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 that to to improve the level of of knowledge of my, of the of the CPL. In kind of uh, in terms of football, uh, I think Hong Kong again uh, have a pretty decent level, mm, but in my opinion, CPL have better talent players still. You know, uh, Canadian football we see today with the women, but I can extrapolate to. Two men, two men football. I see a lot of talent players here, but unfortunately, um, the life of the professional football that is not in the point should be right now. I, I think we are progressing, but it's still a way, way to go. In that, in that, mo in that thing, I think it's kind of similar to, to Hong Kong because Hong Kong players go to China, the good ones to play. Same thing in Canada, the good ones go to USA. And I think in both in both countries we have make a step forward uh, because I saw in both countries uh, a lot of talent players. About Morafusi, I need to say again I, I think he's a really underestimated player here. He's one one of my favorites for York. I think uh, he read very good the game. He has uh, controlled the game for a game of building up or a game of uh, possession. And for me, so it was a big loss for York. And for the league, uh, I like him. I know he plays in Singapore League. I know him, and I was uh, another another proof that a player coming from that league can play here. Um, when I play in Indonesia and in Thailand, my first year, it was a stigma in Europe. Oh, this guy play already in Asia, cannot play in Europe. And I have to say, when I play in Austria, it was just because I was so stubborn that player people tell me I cannot come back to. To Europe, playing from uh, playing in Asia, that is, uh, you know why? Now I want to play in Europe, and I want to show you how we can play in Europe. And in that time, it was not that common. But now, right now, you see, I don't know, uh, so many players like Paulinho was playing in China, come back and play in uh, Barcelona. Uh, but even uh, this guy from he played in China now, come back to Atletico Madrid, and he's playing. Amazing, Carrasco, Gianni Carrasco. He's even playing better than he when he left to China. But there are so many cases that I can mention. Um, so I don't like the fact that people who don't really know a market or a league could be a Chinese league, could be the Hong Kong league, or who could be could be the CPL. Say, oh, I heard, oh, I said CPL, yeah, but it's only three years of football. The level is bad, and I have to say always, no, no, you have to work the league. It's better than you think. Yeah. Why don't you? Why you say that if you never follow the league? I hate the like people just talk because Canada is not a big potent like uh, like could be now USA or could be Mexico in terms of football. Uh, 
but they saw our, you saw in the goal we deserve even to win against well we I spoke like I'm a Canadian <laughs> Canada deserve to win against against Mexico and um, they are progressing and progressing and every day they are um, getting better and better and I hope for 2022 or for 2023 Canada it's gonna be a surprise same at Qatar nobody give a, a Qatar what is this a country of two million and look they were in the semifinals and playing a playing an amazing first half they deserve more even against the USA and they they won last year against teams like South Korea Japan and Australia so right now in a global world we are in terms of football as, as, as well I can tell you that every corner in the planet where I play there are good players I can say in Jordan in Canada and I see players and you can see and boost us and these and so many players that can make a the can play in Europe for sure. You have the opportunity. Yeah, it's it's interesting you mentioned that. A couple of things, right? Like when you see the bomber game sold out, you just have to dream of what it would be like to have a Valor game full. Like as a supporter, every time we're there, we go, man, like we need to get this place full. And I'll I'll tell you what, Jose, I drag everyone I know, everyone I know to that <laughs> game. And I'll tell you that Please. I haven't had one person that once I bring them says, you know, I don't like this. Every single one of them goes, this is amazing. Why didn't I come to yeah. this sooner? And so um, I love that you pointed that out. And then the second part, you know, you're right. There is a stigma around countries around this world, you know, and wh whether or not they're football nations or soccer nations, right? And it doesn't really come down to that. It comes down to the person, the athletes, and what they want to do with themselves in a lot of senses, right? So it's a really, really great answer. Thank you so much for letting me uh, ask you a question there from the chat. So you mentioned going back to Austria and kind of wanting to prove yourself. Uh, so you played in Austria. And then after that, you actually went to a, a, a team in Jordan. What was it like going and playing in the Middle East? Well, in that time, it was difficult. They tell me if I was crazy because ISIS dies. No, it was a, a big thing in that moment. Uh, right after I signed the contract, I remember they captured a pilot, a Jordan pilot, and they killed him. Uh, so my parents, they told me, come back home. This is dangerous uh, because Jordan was in the border with Syria, with Iraq. And, but to be honest, since I landed there, I can say that Jordan is one of the most friendly countries where I play. The people is amazing and, and really safe country as well. When you see the map, you see the borders are Palestine and Iraq and Israel, and as I mentioned, but then you go there, I never, never felt any danger. So the beginning was kind of scared about that, but then I felt uh, amazed with the people there. I, th I feel that they are kind of similar character, like in Cyprus and Spain, like Mediterranean people, Arabs are kind of similar to us, like the Spanish. And I love to play there. Um, it helped me a lot to develop my game in a defensive way because until that moment, I always play as more offensive player, number eight, number 10, uh, always uh, offensive midfielder. But uh, the fact of playing in, in Jordan, uh, my coach really need a number six, uh, more defensive. And the fact also that the, the, the football in Jordan was really physical and really, you need to be really defensive there. In my team also were fighting for relegation. So it helped me, helped me a lot on develop my defensive way. Probably if I don't play in Jordan, I would not be here. Uh, because here I signed as a defensive midfielder. Never in my life I play until until I play in Jordan as, uh, in that position. So you never know. It's um, something that I think I heard from Steve Jobs, Steve Jobs and one uh, speech I really love in the University of Stanford, he said, you always have to join points and something that happened in your past and maybe you don't even important. It makes sense after some years. Um, kind of the things that make sense when I say in in Canada, it's OK. Now I send for a deficit midfielder and I play in Jordan. I help me to to go through that position. And I now know what it's about. So. So here, here's a question. And we're, it's going to feel like we're skipping forward a little bit, but but we are. We're going to skip forward a little bit. Canadian Premier League, when was the first time you heard about this league? Uh, I heard 
about uh, because of Adam Mitter uh, was um, uh, I met him in in Indonesia when I was playing there. He went there. Uh, he went there for a one trial or something, and I and I met him, and then I start to follow him. Um, so then I start to see some, sometimes he post, especially in the IG field. I saw that locker room. I saw that facilities. I saw the stadiums full, like, not full, but 10,000 people um, in the stand. So I said, wow, this is the first year of Canada League. So I start to to see also because Ramon Soria, uh, I uh, from Edmonton, the captain of Edmonton, I met him also a long time ago. We, we both play a road and, um, and we talk a lot. So I saw him as well. Um, and then I start to pay more attention. I see more highlights and even games. And I say, oh, this is good. This is the level is pretty good. Better for uh, being a first year. I never heard about Canadian League before. I heard about one guy here, Xavi, uh, who after that uh, he started to coach with Canadian national team. But when he played, he was not professional. And when I saw him, it was even the stadium they didn't, they didn't look professional. And it was like four years ago, uh, four years before that. But when I saw Adam Mitter things, I started to follow. It looks very professional. How the CPL and one soccer make it amazing job from them, and I said, "Wow, this looks very nice." So I, I was the one who contacted him. I said, "Please, if you heard some, for something there, I, I will really go there because I was playing in Saudi Arabia. I got married, and my wife didn't like the idea of being in Saudi Arabia. It was tough. She couldn't even work there. She have to wear a, a hijab or a burqa for them. For their, for her, it was not easy." So we say, okay, since we get married, we're gonna find a place. It's good for both, not only for me. Like, <laughs> okay, that's the deal. So Canada sounds perfect. Everybody in Spain, you heard about Canada and everybody told you good things. So suddenly it was in April when I contacted Adam. But then I think it was in June. I, I was actually in my honeymoon, I think. And he told me, hey, uh, I think uh, Valor is looking for a midfielder. Unfortunately, because of an injury of Josip Golubar, after that I met him. Uh, I feel bad he tore the ACL. An um, amazing boy. Uh, I became a really good friend with him, but in, I didn't know that happened. It was because of him, you know? But I, I knew they were looking for a midfielder. Um, uh, one agent, Japanese agent, uh, I don't know, get in contact with, I guess, Damian Robb and and the people in Valor, uh, they start to negotiate, and then I sign and sign for Valor. It was uh, um, I don't know after one week of three days of negotiation, it was easy to get an agreement, uh, easy to get an agreement with Damian, uh, especially with the, the most what I told with. A um, um, few days later, they told me, okay, you can take your time. I think I signed, and the next day they told me, okay, you want we can you can travel. I was in Hong Kong in that moment with my wife. Um, and I said, but if no, take your time. You got one week because I was in the middle of the season. I said, no, no, I want to uh, travel tomorrow. So I think because the difference of, of time, it was 13 hours. And I couldn't even barely sleep. After six hours, I was in a plane doing my, uh, getting all my stuff in the, in the package, everything. and going to that plane. And the funny thing is that uh, I travel. It was like the longest a trip of my life, like 28 hours. Um, and when I arrived, I met Damian, and I thought it was gonna be easy. So, okay, uh, we're gonna make your presentation with Rob. I was kind of, I didn't know what I was, 13 <laughs> hours difference. And they made me to train, uh, oh, like to practice. Goodness. I felt like, oh, and it was tough to, for me. And then I traveled to Edmonton, and in Edmonton, uh, it was 6, 6 p.m. or 5 p.m. I was feeling like asleep. My jet, I never felt jet lag before. And believe me, I travel a lot. And it was crazy that jet lag. Um, and that was my first experience. I said, please, I cannot play this game. And I remember my first game on the bench. It was uh, against Edmonton. I don't know if you remember, if you remember we have a delay because of storms. Mm -hmm. uh, like four or five hours. One, one, one o'clock, yeah, and I was there fighting with myself to not fall asleep. I say, imagine if I fall asleep now in the, here in the locker room with all my teammates. So it was a crazy... So I didn't make the debut. So then I made the debut after four days against Forge. We lost, but I played 45 minutes. Um, 
um, that was my my first game in the in the CPL. And I remember that. I remember there was an excitement for us to see you get out there. We felt like we needed that piece, you know, a little bit of experience and somebody to kind of, and I can remember you, and I don't know if you, you, you remember this, but I can remember you standing back in that kind of defensive midfield spot and, and barking orders, letting people know where they needed to be really. And, and it, you know what we saw, as soon as you got on the field, we saw a better organization. We saw the, 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 um, I don't know if you we call it leadership, but you really did bring something to that club, and we've loved you ever since you've arrived. Let's talk a little bit about this. Thank you. Valor fans love you, Jose. We all absolutely adore you, and and I think part of that is the fact that you when you talk when when you're sharing you know pictures and yourself on social media, you talk a lot about Manitoba, and you you've sort of made it your home. Not only because you've had you know your daughter was born in Winnipeg; she's a Winnipegger now. Um, you know, and we had, my son was born similar time as your daughter. So we'd had those conversations, but what is, is Winnipeg home for you now? Like, do you feel at home here in Winnipeg? Yes, absolutely. Um, the fact of the first year I stay here the whole winter, um, until we start the precision the next year, it helped me to, uh, love the people here. Hate the cold here as well. I have to say, <laughs> we I know it's pretty much cold in my life. Uh, it was really, really tough. I think it's the toughest part. Um, but yeah, it's my third season here. This year, after the season, I'm gonna stay here again uh, all the winter. And uh, so it's just kind of my home. Yeah, I feel that. Um, but it's only because of the how the people make me feel. Sometimes. I feel in depth, especially with the supporters, because I remember after yeah some only some games I would start to play very regularly uh, in the team and just uh, I don't know after my 15, 16 games the first year I start to hear my my name songs um, about me and I, I I really feel the welcoming and the love of from the people um um it's something that i never forget i'm a, i'm not gonna forget how the people here in the train how the people in the stands how the people in the city when they recognize me make me feel uh it's something that you cannot describe and you can not pay off uh, enough to the people like you that contact me and and tell me so many kind and good words that encourage me to to play for you guys so it's kind of big for me some of them uh, are even like by chance now even my friends even people in the trends like one of my best friends in in manitoba in, in winnipeg is is paola and roddy one pe from people from the trends i really uh, take care of my family especially in the difficult really difficult times we got like going to the bubble a couple of times things that people don't know about senna daryl uh, coach gail or damian the people hey, patrick we are not we have family and we have to stay five weeks six weeks away of our families um especially for the players like me or there we don't have family here we need to find another family and and i think in my case we found that family in this case as i mentioned like paola um people in the train always give a hand to us to do to, to help us to when uh when i'm playing abroad so me and my family my wife really appreciate all because it's not about football. Of course, football is important side, but we are also human beings. And and the fact that I really love about the supporters uh, in Winnipeg, or supporters for Valor and make you different, is that here you are something more than only supporters that cheer the, the team if we are winning. Why I say that? Because uh, the best moment for me, feeling that you are something important, something special, sorry, uh, because yeah, I, I play with uh, 60,000 people in Indonesia, and don't get me wrong, the supporters there really love me. I got a connection then amazing, and I will never forget them as well. And some countries, I always feel I don't know why, to be honest, like really easy to connect with the fans. I don't know my way of playing. I don't know why, but I feel always maybe with the coaches or with some other people, but with the with the supporters or with a special connection. But uh, he, uh, it's sometimes related or, or be 
connected with the with the results, especially if they got good. Okay, it's easy, and they, you know, they 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 tell you good things, but. Sometimes we got bad results, and again, I, I come back to 2019, and we lost 8-0, my biggest defeat, embarrassing defeat in my whole career. I said, come on, I have to stay now with 33 years old to get a defeat like this, to suffer in the field like this. But after this, uh, even the fans never a bad word to me, towards me, to the team. The next day, we, you were there again supporting in the stands. Uh, for me, that's the real supporter. Because support now that we are leading the table, uh, when the things are good, uh, it's easy. It's easy way to be a supporter of Valor FC. But uh, it, for me, it's, what is important is you were always there in the bad moments. And that is the for me that it comes. When I score a goal, I know everybody's going to be there. When we are in the... Uh, after a win or after I get an MVP or the, or the team is in the right of the table, in the top of the table, I know supporters is, are going to be there and, and in social media and encouraging us. But you, again, value the real value supporters. Uh, you stay there all the way. Um, some images come to my mind, like, for example, when we were in the... Uh, you are not allowed to come to the stadium because of the pandemic. And some of you are out of the stadium and um, with flags um, and the the players, maybe we don't tell you so oh, that often what we, we, we should, but I speak in the name of all of my teammates and the coaches and that uh, for, for us, uh, you are big and you make us have that energy and um, you are a bless for us. Uh, you give us so much energy that maybe you don't re really feel like, okay, maybe the players don't feel it, but we really feel it. We do feel it. And we appreciate it uh, a lot. So it's a big, big shout out to Nikki and the Red River Rising crew. The, the, the trench does incredible work. And, 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 you know, as somebody who just got into, you know, my first supporters group, it, it was such a welcoming experience. And I think, I think the, you know, I really like hearing that from you, Jose, because that 8-0 loss was painful for us. But we wanted to be there for you and experience it with you because we want to experience the good times with you too, right? And I think that's part of being a supporter is we're there for the tough times. We'll be there for you. And then we're going to be there again for when things go well. So about the bubble this year, I know that you didn't get a chance to play, but you were you were in the bubble. What was it like being in the bubble this year for the kickoff? Was it a good experience? Was it a frustrating experience? There was some conversation around, you know, gym gym access, those sorts of things at the hotel. What can you talk about with that bubble experience? Mm, okay, if uh, for me it was a nightmare, I have to say. <laughs> this year was tough for me. Um, because, of course, I wanted to be there. And, of course, I'm really, really happy. And, and uh, at least we got really, really good results, amazing results. Um, the atmosphere was amazing with the boys, with the staff, with uh, every single person who compound uh, Valor. Um, but at the same time, uh, I think the people who play sports uh, or even know, you, you will understand me why I say it's a nightmare. Because you, when you are injury, and you really want to play, but at the same time you are 24 hours with your teammates, but you cannot even do a one training with them. That's all where why you are there. At the same time you are far away from well, far away. You are in Winnipeg, but you cannot see your family. At least we are lucky that year was in Winnipeg. So sometimes they sneak out and they, they come to the fence after the game and even to the hotel, and I can see my wife and my and my baby. But uh, but you are there for five weeks. Um, you kind of hope that the the situation is gonna be better, the injury is gonna heal, but then you see it's not. It's, it's not something minor. It's worse than we expected. It's worse than you think. Um, you have to be more weeks and more weeks out, and and the pain. You check every single day. The first thing you do in the morning is I hope I hope. Uh, uh, the, the pain is going away or I feel less pain and, and you, do feel, you don't feel it's going that fast because you have a, a major injury, even some a tough toe. 
but uh, it was kind of of, uh, of worse uh, injury that we expect and, we, and I, that I thought in the beginning. So I'm already nine weeks. Um, again, the only good thing for me is that the team was with an excellent atmosphere because we're winning and because we have an amazing uh, communication and relationship with, between along all the players. But at the same time, you want to be there, uh, especially when the fans start to come. At some point, I felt like, okay, uh, I'm really happy for the team, but I want to be to be feel part of that. And uh, I would like to do if, if if I said I feel 100% part when that when I play. It's not like that. I wanna even when I'm on the bench and I feel, but feeling the sta- staying in the stands, of course I support. But even I I suffer more because I suffer much more, and you cannot. Uh, I don't know. You cannot help. In any in any how, um, uh, so it was kind of difficult for me. I have to I have to say, and some personal things. My my wife are alone there with the baby, so it was tough. Um, it was tough, but the positive things. We went there, top on the table. They have, the fans were happy. Uh, the, all the players were happy. The supporters are every supporter went there, trench or not. Every supporter was happy. I saw the faces. We play. Really good game, so uh, it was an amazing thing for the club and for the supporters because I think the from the staff after the three years they deserve that and for a player like the Fede, Rav, me that we were in the in the more difficult moments and we always said and and I always said last year we have an amazing team even first year I think we have a, a really good team sometimes football is like this. Um, this year we got more results, and don't get me wrong, we have an amazing team this year. But I think that the the other years we also deserve some credit. Uh, but uh, th- this is how it's football. Now we got the result, we got the three points, three points, three points. We got that credit that we fully deserve this year. Is how. But uh, with my point, we saying this is sometimes the three points or the points makes whole, the whole difference. And I don't think I don't uh, think is that that gap difference between, for example, last year our team and this year. Uh, but it's all about points. It's all about the three points. What matters, you know? Uh, same thing. Uh, before the bubble, we're not amazing team, unbeatable. Like we cannot be defeat. And now we got three losses, and we are not there. No, no. It doesn't work like that. I know for outside uh, sports. Maybe is what it is. Like everything is about victory, but like that poem, and I love that poem. I think uh, Marcelo Bielsa said, like it's, I don't know the translation in English, but kind of like victory and defeat are all are both uh, uh, like an imposter. You know, like uh, I know an imposter. I don't know the name in English. Like uh, both cheaters. Like yeah. you cannot trust on them. Both of them. You know, it's. it's uh, but nowadays the football and the sport, the sport, professional sport is about this. It's about winnings. If you don't get the win, you are bad. If you get the win, you are the best. It's- I have to make that, uh, sorry, to, to the, especially now that I'm coaching kids for 15 years all. And I said, I don't, I don't want to just focus on the result. It's not focusing only on the result. It's more, more than that. Um, you can agree with me. Jeremy, that some games maybe we can play a wonderful game and, and get a defeat, mm-hmm. and sometimes maybe we play bad game and we get a win. So this is how football is. It's why we love and hate the, this sport at the same time. Yeah, it's it's the love, you know, it's the love, and, and it's also part of that frustration. It's like you know, some di- days, like you say, you know, you know, Canada might play a great game against Mexico and still not get into that Gold Cup final, right? For example. <laughs> I'm still sour. I'm still sad. Um, <laughs> I have a question here for you from the chat. Uh, do you plan on staying here, uh, I guess, in Canada long term? And do you think staying in Canada is good for your future overall? So interesting question. Yeah, um, I think from Almeria, I didn't play four years in a row in the same club. Uh, right now is my third year, in a, my third season in a row playing for Valor. Um, I feel really motivated. I, I don't feel 
uh, to retire right now. I feel I've still Jose Galan for some seasons more. And my plan is to play there, uh, to play here, sorry, uh, to play for Valor. It's my, I always say it's my first priority. Even when first year I got offered from Atletico Ottawa, uh, I say my first, my priority is always to play for Valor. And this is still remains there. Uh, coaches know, people in the club know, I think supporters already know. So as long as the club uh, still want me, um, uh, I'm motivated to stay here. And it means it's long term because uh, at the same time I'm planning also to, I'm coaching already, some kids, uh, 14 years old. Um, I like to coach. I think in, there is a, especially here in Winnipeg, I don't know other cities in, in, in Canada, but here in Manitoba and in Winnipeg, I feel like there's a, a still a way, a way to do, especially with academics, with uh, these kids of those ages. And I want to be part of that, helping with my knowledge and with my experience to those kids that they are starting now to love the game. I hope like uh, winnings like today will of Canada help that desire for the kids to make it professional to and to love soccer even more. So that's why one of the reasons I'm so happy. Other one is because I know the city Scott personally, so I'm happy for her as well and for all the Canadian people. And I really hope when I was watching today in TV that game, I say I really hope now the boys and the girls say, okay, I want to make this like they did today, make history. Um, they need examples for, for that. We need a stronger league. Like again, we're in the, in the way. Um, and me also want to be part of that. I think again, we need to work a lot, a lot, uh, with academics, with those kids from 10 to 18 years old. Um, that's why I want to be in long-term here in Winnipeg to help with my knowledge, uh, to these kids. And at the same time, to the players who are making even this year, no, we have uh, so many young players, 18, 19, 20. They never played professional before. So I think boys uh, like Daryl, uh, Andrew, Kevin, me, and the, the on the on the locker room. I do speak with one of them. Uh, I think we help a lot, not only in the field, like also in the locker room. The way the way we think we have to act. The ways you have to be a professional is only it's not only on the field. Of the field, you have to also act like a professional. So that's that's why I think uh, people, veteran veteran people like like me, they, these people, uh, we have to stay in the game, and that mix make the the team uh, the teams stronger. Absolutely. So that's some of the reason that I wanna I wanna be in Winnipeg. And I think it's it's so, you know, as a Canadian fan and also as a Valor supporter, it's so heartwarming that you see the opportunity here with our youth, with with the generations that are coming up in this country, that there is, you know, there's gaps. We could use better coaching. We could use clear path to pro. The Canadian Premier League is going to continue to grow. And I'm really excited that you see that opportunity and want to be part of it, Dylan. Like, Jose, that is fantastic. So before we wrap up here, I just wanted to point out, you know, the fact that you mentioned that you stayed in Winnipeg for the winter the first year, I don't think you realize how enduring and how amazing that is for Winnipeggers because we have hockey players that come in here and play and they do everything they can to not be here in the summer. <laughs> so it is, it is, it's amazing to see that, you know, you embraced it, you survived that first winter and it was a really cold one. I mean, the last one was really cold too. It's only going to get worse, but it, it is it's a it's a stubbornness that winnipeggers have we get up in the winter we hate everything about it but we get up we complain about it and we do everything we need to do anyway you know there's a little bit of that stubborn hardiness in this town and i think you fit in really really well jose it, it's been a pleasure talking to you i'm really really excited uh to see you back on the field and so that'll be my last question how is your toe doing how's the injury are we expecting to see you back in the next couple of weeks or how are you feeling well, I know I cannot give you an answer because I don't really know. It's an injury um, that is bothering me a lot. I could say even I have the ACL, as I told you, but this probably is the most frustrating injury I, I got because sometimes I feel good, but then uh, uh, the next day, I don't know, I feel worse again. So 
we are getting treatment, we are getting um, everything as, uh, as we can as possible like to, to get it better. Um, of our timeline, I'm already in the eight weeks since I got injury. They told me around 12 weeks, but I don't I don't want to put times again because it kind of stress me more. Um, if I can get on the field before those 12 weeks, perfect. But if not, let's see, let's heal it. And still there are so many games to play. Um, the only thing I guarantee you is that I will come back uh, as strong as, uh, as I was before, because I think this year, especially because I was playing in Spain, um, I was feeling really good on the say, but he came in a, in a bad moment, the injury, but um, I just really looking forward to play in front of you. My goal was to play 16, the first opener game there, but again, I don't want to put uh, any pressure because that will be my ninth, 10 week, 10 week, I think, so it's still early, but let's see. Uh, let's see when I can be back. I'm looking forward, but just from here, I'm, I will keep uh, supporting my teammates that they are doing great. Uh, I know we are losing out three times, three games in a row, but I know what are the guys, the guys uh, made of. Uh, we are capable of many things, so I know we're gonna come back again one more time. Yeah, I I know this that the squad is is gonna come back. We have the quality, we have the leadership, sure. and we have a really great talented team i think really really great and we're really looking forward to seeing you back on the ground with us uh jose and 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 whenever that is we'll be there to cheer for you your song will come up you know it will you'll hear us so big thank you for taking the time to join us today jose really do appreciate it thank you have so yourself, much have yourself a lovely day and uh and and good luck to you soon thank you jeremy for your time nice to talk with you all ciao, the best ciao. thanks so that was Jose Galan of Valor FC, a Canadian Premier League player who plays, uh, has played all over the world, starting with Atletico Madrid in terms of his first professional experience and all over the world. We didn't get a chance to pick uh, through all of the different pieces that he uh, that he was he was part of all the different clubs that he was part of but what an experience to bring him on. Thank you so much to Valor and Jose for making time for me today. That has been episode six all right thank you everyone for jumping on today really do appreciate it this has been a really really great episode i have some editing to do ahead of me but we'll get the pod out tomorrow so big thank you to everybody who was in in chat today you guys are absolute legends i know it was a little bit tough with the, the technical issues off the beginning there if you're interested in following along on the podcast i've just dropped the links in there for you you could also join the discord if you're interested, or you can find me on socials um, that are listed all in chat there. So let's go ahead and find somebody to raid who's doing uh, the old Twitch sports. Thank you very much, uh, Ed. Really do appreciate you being here. Honestly, it's uh, I was nervous to interview Galan. He's such a he gives up so much time to fans and uh, in the city, and and uh, I just he had.